Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to the Beer Institute and our third installment of the You Ought to Know a Beer Industry Employee. I'm Jim McGreevy, President and CEO of the Beer Institute. We're one of the oldest trade associations in Washington, D.C., representing the brewing industry since 1865. There are over 7,000 breweries and beer importers in the U.S. today. 2.1 million Americans owe their livelihoods to the production, distribution, and sale of beer, totaling nearly $330 billion in economic output. Beer is an important cultural, social, and economic contributor to our way of life in the United States. And you're about to hear from one of those 2.1 million Americans. Julia Foxworthy is the Director of Innovation for the Beer Division at Constellation Brands. She began her career in strategy consulting and has since spent over a decade in the food and beverage industry, previously managing popular consumer brands like Nature Valley and Velveeta. She's been with Constellation since 2014, where she helped to establish and build the innovation, de uh, innovation department. Welcome, Julia Foxworthy. Thank you, Jim. I'm really excited to be here. So Julia, you're the Director of Innovation uh, for Constellation Brands, which sells popular brands like uh, Corona, Modelo, Victoria, Pacifico, and others. So what's it like to invent beer for a living? <laughs> Thanks for asking, Jim. Uh, it's pretty great. Um, it really is a dream job. Um, I feel so fortunate to get to wake up every day and work alongside talented brewers and innovators and marketers. Um, and we're charged with uh, creating the next generation of beer um, for some of the world's most popular beer brands. So um, it's an honor and it's a lot of fun. So uh, most folks or every, but every person on this, uh, on this webinar will, will know Corona. They'll know Modelo in particular, those two brands that Constellation sells. They probably don't know much about Constellation as a company. So could you just give them a little sense of um, who Constellation is, how it began, and um, what, what it's like today? Yeah, sure. Uh, Constellation is a, it's a fascinating story. Um, we started out back in the mid-1940s. Uh, we were a small wine company in upstate New York. Um, and over the years, the company grew and grew. It went public in 1973. Um, and then in the early 90s, we acquired uh, Barton. Um, and so that brought uh, beer into our portfolio um, and started us down the path of being a more total beverage alcohol uh, company. Um, in 2013, uh, we got the rights to the Grupo Modelo brands, which include Modelo, uh, Corona, Pacifico, Victoria, among others. Um, and with that, we also got the ability to go from being uh, what we were previously an importer um, to being a brewer. Um, so with the full ownership of those brands, we also took ownership uh, of the breweries in Mexico. And so overnight, we, we had to learn uh, how not just to market and, and sell those great brands, but how to make them. Um, so we've been through an incredible transformation in the past seven years. We have hired and built out uh, entire teams that didn't exist uh, back in 2013. Uh, we have built out an incredibly talented R&D team. Uh, we have expanded our brewery in uh, Piedras Negras, which we refer to as uh, Nava, uh, as well as uh, added additional brewing uh, sites, uh, both in Mexico uh, and in the U.S. So it's been quite a journey. Uh, we're still on it, but, um, you know, it's it's really uh, an incredible story of a, a small company uh, that has grown tremendously over the past, um, you know, few decades. So from a wine company to a beer brewer, uh, largely from a beer importer to a uh, to a beer brewer, uh, yeah. now having now having control of one of the largest breweries uh, in Mexico, just 12 miles south of the U.S.-Mexico border, uh, mm -hmm. really a state-of-the-art brewery. Um, with a state-of-the-art brewery comes the need in beer and in alcohol to innovate. Uh, innovation is king in beer, um, and that's uh, the job that you have uh, uh, and shepherd through your company. Why don't you just talk a little bit about the importance of innovation in beer 
some examples in your own company uh, uh, of uh, great innovations that uh, that you've started um, and how innovation fits into the broader beer business and the broader beverage alcohol business. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, innovation has has always been important in beer. I think uh, the, the best brewers really are all innovators at heart. Um, I love learning about some of the things that our, our brewers are doing or inventing, uh, some of the, the fun things that they come up with. But, um, you know, when I think about it from a consumer standpoint, what's really incredible is how much innovation has accelerated in the beer industry. Uh, so I just saw the other day that um, four of the five top growing brands uh, in the past month were brands that did not exist in 2019. So Constellation and our competition, we're, we're innovating as fast as we can and consumers can't get enough of it. Um, and so I think what's been really incredible to see is that even during uh, an unusual and a challenging year, uh, consumers still have an incredible appetite uh, for innovation. So when I think about some of the things that Constellation has launched over the past few years, that ranges from Corona Premier, um, which was our entry into the low calorie, low carb space. Uh, we launched Corona Refresca just a few years ago. Um, that was Corona's first entry into the flavored alcohol space. Um, that's a really terrific product with uh, full tropical flavors um, that are really refreshing. Um, and then we've also dabbled in some other uh, areas. Uh, for example, we recently launched uh, a test uh, market uh, evaluation of a new product called Modelo Reserva, um, which is taking barrel aged uh, cues like tequila barrels and whiskey barrels um, and incorporating those tastes and flavors with uh, the Modelo uh, brand. So consumers really have a limitless appetite for things that are new and interesting. Uh, so it's our job to uh, keep following along with the consumer, keep up with what they're looking for, and then and deliver a quality product uh, that keeps them excited and keeps them coming back. So um, four of the top five brands in uh, beer brands in the United States now didn't exist in 2019. You've got a couple of those yourself. Um, so innovation is important, but you at Constellation have such a storied history with those Mexican brands. Corona and Modelo in particular. Modelo is just rocketing off the shelves over the last uh, seven to 10 years. Mm -hmm. how, do you, um, how do you think about innovation within the context of um, uh, sort of um, protecting or honoring these, these big brands that have been around a long time and people love? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, Modelo, I mean, what an incredible story. That is a brand that has grown every year for the past 30 years. Um, there are very few, not just beer brands, but consumer products brands that have grown that consistently over time. So uh, when our team was tasked with looking at how do we grow the Modelo brand through innovation, um, it, it was a tall order. Uh, we, you know, we wanted to make sure we didn't screw it up, right? So, um, you know, the first thing we do, and, and this is true for Modelo, but really everything we do, um, we talk to the consumer. We spend a ton of time talking to consumers who love our brand. We talk to consumers who don't like our brand at all. We want to know uh, why not. Um, and so, you know, in that research, in talking to Modelo drinkers and non-drinkers, one of the things that we heard from them was, uh, we love Modelo. Uh, we love the clean, crisp, refreshing taste of Modelo. It, you know, kind of goes with everything and goes anywhere. Um, and we love the quality. We know that it's a brand that we can trust, that we can rely on. Um, but we're also looking for something a little different. We, we want a little bit more flavor. We want a little bit more variety. And, and wouldn't it be great if Modelo um, could keep those same uh, quality cues, but also bring a, a little bit of a different flavor to the mix? And that's how Modelo Reserva was born. Um, we found an opportunity to, to bring a little bit more flavor uh, to the consumer, especially to folks who were uh, drinking uh, spirits in addition to drinking Modelo, um, but do it with the same integrity um, as the core Modelo brand. Um, so we're, we're really excited. Like I said, we, uh, we just launched that recently. So we're 
we're evaluating and, and seeing how it goes, um, but so far so good. Well, you talked about spirits there. Uh, obviously beer and spirits are big competitors. Beer is the most popular brand, uh, beverage of uh, alcoholic beverage in the United States, and we want to keep it that way, but spirits mm -hmm. is always fast down our heels. Um, you're, you're looking to innovate uh, uh, products that uh, people enjoy. People will come back for a second, a third, a hundredth time to them. Um, but you also have your eyes sort of on making sure that these brands can compete in the marketplace against spirits. Talk about the, the, the concept of the beer occasion and how occasions fit into your thinking uh, when you're innovating and you know, trying to trying to get that occasion from uh, from spirits or wine for beer. Yeah, we we talk a lot about occasions when it comes to innovation. Um, it's really important for us to understand not just what the consumer is looking for from a taste profile or from a brand, but where are they going to drink this? Um, and so when we think about beer occasions, quite often those are social occasions. Those are times when people are together with their friends and their family. Um, they're often outdoor occasions. So folks might be out in a park, at a picnic, on a boat, um, certainly in the case of Corona, on the beach. Um, and what's really uh, wonderful about beer is that it spans all sorts of different emotional occasions. Uh, so you have moments where you might be drinking beer uh, to relax and unwind at the end of a long day. Um, or you might be out at a party celebrating something, and, and beer is a great fit for that as well. Um, so we really try to think about, uh, again, not just the flavor, but but how does that fit uh, into uh, into the occasion? And so, you know, one thing that's been really interesting to see in the past, say, four to five years is uh, consumers who were drinking in the spirits category, were drinking in the wine category, um, they had a lot of dissatisfactions with those categories because as you can imagine, uh, wine, spirits, definitely not as portable as beer, certainly not as convenient, um, might not have the same variety of flavors uh, that the beer category has. So there was a huge opportunity to bring those drinkers into our category through convenience and through great taste. And we found that uh, the seltzer um, sort of explosion, if you will, um, has been uh, what has brought uh, many of those consumers over to the beer category, um, many of them for the first time. So we have folks who are drinking vodka or drinking rosé, uh, would have never thought to pick up one of our products just a few years ago. Uh, and now they have Corona Hard Seltzer um, and they have Tulane Seltzer and they have some other um, of the great seltzer products that are in the current Constellation portfolio. And those are now options for them. And so they have um, the same uh, refreshing sessionability uh, of beer, um, but they come in more flavors. They're a little bit more interesting, a little bit different, um, and that helps them uh, to fit into more occasions. So we found a lot of success uh, with seltzer uh, as far as attracting folks um, from the spirits and wine categories into beer. You know, Julia, um, hard seltzer is probably the perfect example of an innovation in beer. It could be that some folks watching us I didn't even know that seltzer is beer. It is beer. It's taxed as beer. It's um, made in a brewery, um, and it's so it's certainly beer. Um, talk a little bit about uh, how you, in your role, look at um, look at other categories when you're thinking about innovation. Uh, hard seltzer is a perfect example. It's got a lot of flavor. It's meant to have flavor for consumers who are looking for more and more flavor. But it also um, comes from really the non-alcoholic business. Uh, seltzer mm -hmm. has been booming in uh, in uh, in the sort of soda uh, world for the last 20 years. Um, what do you learn from other categories that help you do your job? Yeah, that's that's a great question, and um, it's it is probably my favorite part of this job, which is uh, we spend a ton of time not just talking to consumers, but really observing them, trying to understand uh, both what it is that they tell us they do and then what it is that they actually do, right? So um, we do a lot of work to observe the brands that consumers are buying, uh, certainly within our category, 
Uh, we spend a lot of time looking at that, but um, especially in the past few years, we have put an increased focus on looking at how consumers are behaving outside of our category. Um, so that can start anywhere from doing uh, an ethnography with consumers where we might go to their homes and literally open their fridge and look at what's inside. Um, our team has traveled around the world. We've gone as far away as Tokyo and Mexico City. We have gone uh, as close to home as just uh, taking the L to a new neighborhood. What are the other brands uh, that consumers are, are purchasing and, and what is it that they really love about them? So a few years ago, uh, to your point, Jim, we observed that the uh, sparkling water uh, category was, was just really uh, going crazy. Um, people were drinking uh, sparkling uh, seltzers uh, and replacing traditional um, carbonated soft drinks with those uh, kind of water and, and soda type beverages. And so we had an inkling that that might eventually make its way to the alcohol space. And so um, we actually originally launched uh, a hard seltzer under the Svedka brand. Um, it didn't do as well as we hoped. Um, and we think we were maybe just a little early <laughs> to market. And so we, we went back, we learned from that experience and we rolled out Corona hard seltzer this year, which has been an incredible success. Um, we are number four in the category with just one single SKU, um, which is a pretty uh, incredible accomplishment. Um, and that's really all built on observing uh, what it is that folks were looking for outside of the category. And a lot of those things were um, easy to drink uh, and great nutrition. So beer had been a little late to the betterment space. Um, there weren't as many options in, in beer that delivered low calories, low carbs, um, and still delivered flavor. And that was something consumers had come to expect from other categories. Um, so when we were able to deliver that, consumers went crazy uh, and they um, you know, really adopted seltzer in mass. And I, I think that's you know, uh, where we are today. Um, we have these great products within our category that uh, deliver on the wellness expectations that consumers have now, um, influenced by the other categories that they're shopping in. Yeah, gee whiz, that's such an important point. I mean, uh, beer was a little late to uh, the sort of the health and wellness space. Consumers, probably many on this uh, uh, watching us now, uh, want to see uh, companies um, uh, uh, producing products that are better for you. Uh, Seltzer is a great example. Uh, Non-alcoholic beer is starting to really take off in the United States. It's a it's a it's a big part of the beer segment in other countries, particularly in Western Europe, but um, not so much here, but that's going to change over the course of the next five years, it seems like. Um, so I think we are there in the health and wellness space. And, I, and we're also there in terms of folks on the, on the line here asking questions. I, I neglected to tell you that you could uh, ask questions, but uh, we've got uh, a bunch coming in. So um, why don't we open up the discussion a little more uh, beyond, uh, beyond my questions to you, Julia. And staying on the hard seltzer um, uh, frame. Uh, Emily asks, uh, do you think hard seltzers are a fad or will it be a strong contender in the marketplace for the next good while? Hi, Emily. Great question. Um, no, I don't think it's a fad. I think hard seltzers are here to stay. Um, there's a lot of folks at Constellation and across the industry who've worked in the beer industry for 10, 20, 30 more years. Um, and it's been really incredible to have their perspective on how seltzer compares to the light beer craze of the late 70s and early 80s. Um, and from all indications, uh, seltzer has already blown that out of the water. So just looking at the numbers, the, the growth of seltzer is unprecedented. Um, and yet the uh, household penetration for seltzer is, is still relatively low. So what that tells us is that when people try seltzers, they stick with them, um, but we still have so many more consumers to reach. Um, you know, interestingly, seltzers kind of got started uh, on the East Coast. So for those who are dialing in from DC, you guys were trendsetters in that way. Um, and we find, uh, that the adoption on the West Coast is kind of just now catching up um, to what we saw in the Northeast, say, a year or two ago. 
Um, so still room for a, a lot of growth in Seltzer. And I think what people really love about Seltzers, um, like I was saying before, you have all the nutrition credentials, you have the low calories, the low carbs, uh, gluten-free for, for people who, um, for whom that's important to them. Um, and then you have the flavor variety. And so what Seltzers have really become is sort of a, a base on which our brewers can add and subtract and, and innovate against. So um, it's been a lot of fun. It's been kind of like a new playground for our brewers, um, a new place that they can uh, work with and, and uh, play with. And um, I think they're here to stay. Well, I think you're right. Seltzers are here to stay. So Seltzer is a, a, is a, a success story in innovation, but not all, uh, not all brands stick. Uh, Jim asks, what's the success ratio of new brands? Does every brand yeah. succeed? Uh, no, they don't. <laughs> I have a uh, I have a long list of, of brands that did not stick. Uh, that uh, you know we're not we're not showing the pictures of those today. Um, so the the short answer to your question is um, about eighty percent of new brands fail, um, and that's across all consumer products categories. So um, not not that many stick around for a long time. Um, at Constellation, we actually took a look uh, just earlier this year at what we called our retention rate. Um, and that was a new brand that had been introduced um, by Constellation in the past, uh, call it seven years since we've had an innovation department. Um, and is that brand still being sold uh, in a retailer? Um, and what we found out was that 87% of the new SKUs that we had launched are still being sold. So we were able to flip that uh, statistic from 80% off the shelf to 80 something percent still on the shelf. So we're super proud of that. I'm not a marketer, um, uh, but Julia, but let me, uh, let me ask you another question that's come in from our audience is uh, how do you, um, how do you think about women when you're uh, uh, trying to figure out new brands? How, how do you, how do you approach women or target women? Uh, you know, beer over many years, beer was not so great at uh, at bringing women into uh, into the fold. How do you, uh, as the leader of your department, a, a woman, how do you think about um, uh, the consumer, particularly women? Yeah, I love this question. Um, so thank you to whomever asked it. Um, this topic is really important to me. Uh, when I first started in the beer industry, uh, there were less women in the industry than there are today. And I'm sure tomorrow there will be even more women in the industry. So, you know, one thing I've thought about um, my whole career in the industry is thinking is, you know, how do I reflect more consumers who, who look like me um, and who look like other women um, who like beer, who um, want more options that, that really fit um, their lifestyle and, and their needs. Um, and to keep bringing it back to Seltzer, that's a, that's a great example of how we have been able to meet the needs of our, our female consumers in a way that feels really uh, genuine. So, um, you know, we, we spend a lot of time, as, as I've said, talking to consumers. Um, and the way we approach that is to ask them, um, you know, not just, you know, what beer would you like to drink, but what are some of the things that um, we could do to make your life better? Um, so I think about um, some of the women we've talked to who said, you know, I, I really want more flavor, but a lot of the flavor products, they come in these like really big cans and they don't feel great to hold in my hand. Um, and so I think the industry said, okay, well, why don't we take um, women into consideration and, and think about, you know, what would be a package size that would be more um, appealing to, to women. And I think um, you've seen uh, the sort of um, surge of, of slim cans. And we know from our research that um, just the shift in the can shape has been incredibly appealing to women. Um, you know, and I think I think the other thing that's um, that's important when we talk about this topic is that it's really um, critical for us to not uh, make assumptions about female consumers. I think it's it's really easy uh, for folks to assume all well, women want uh, lower calorie and they don't want really high alcohol. Um, well, there are lots of women out there that they want higher alcohol products. They want 
um, more flavor and, and they're willing to trade off more calories for that. So what that means when it comes to my team is that we spend a lot of time listening. We spend a lot of time probing and asking the what and the why and, and kind of really digging into what consumers uh, want, especially female consumers, rather than just kind of, you know, relying on um, information that might be uh, outdated. And then we translate that all into action um, by developing products with them in mind. So that might mean um, flavors that we know will appeal more to women, uh, like I said, pack sizes, um, or evolving our messaging and our advertising to make sure that we're speaking um, not just to men, but to women as well. So let's talk about your team for a, a few minutes. I think you make a great point that innovation is not just, as we say, uh, the liquid, but it's also the packaging, the uh, the way it's brought to the shelf and, and uh, presented to the consumer. I think you told me when it comes to your team, you told me that uh, you were the second person hired in the innovation department uh, after, um, <laughs> yeah. uh, after uh, it was stood up. Uh, I think you now have maybe 40. Why don't you just tell us a little bit about who those people are, what kind of you touched on sort of the insights folks and the, the folks who are looking, uh, looking at what consumers are interested in, but talk a little bit about how you built the department, um, what those considerations were and the types of the types of people and the types of roles they play in, in uh, Constellation Innovation. Sure. I think when, um, Whenever I meet someone new and tell them what I do, uh, they often ask, well, do you have a background in, in science or brewing? And I say, you know, <laughs> absolutely not. Um, but I have a team that does. Um, and so uh, our team uh, is, is very cross-functional. Um, we, we rely on uh, each other and each other's skill sets to, to get things done. Um, within my core team on innovation, uh, there are seven of us. Um, and we are essentially a, a liaison between our brand teams. So the folks who manage and run uh, our, our big brands like Corona and Modelo every day. Um, and then our R&D and development team. So we uh, translate ideas uh, into guidance uh, for the folks who will be creating the products. Um, and so we have uh, our, our team that sort of um, leads the way and, and scopes um, the uh, innovation idea. And then we have um, folks who represent our insights function that I've, I've spoken a lot about. Um, those are the people on our team that help us talk to consumers, that conduct consumer research, uh, help us evaluate the success of new products. Um, when we're in the development process, they help us evaluate uh, between choices we might be making. So if we're trying to decide between uh, should this package be pink or should it be green? Uh, we can work with our insights team to measure that with consumers and, and make the best choice. Um, we also have an extensive R&D team. What's really interesting about Constellation is that in addition to the import sphere brands that we're talking a lot about uh, that are brewed in Mexico with an incredible team there that has uh, brewers, um, and has uh, sensory insights team members as well. So those are people who are evaluating how does the product taste and how does it smell and how does it feel when you drink it. Um, we also have R&D staff uh, who are based in the US um, at some of our domestic innovation uh, labs. Uh, so we have an office in upstate New York and, and we work with uh, folks there as well. So they're kind of part of our extended family. Um, and then in addition to that, we have um, other cross-functional team members who work in finance, who work um, with our retail partners. So the big grocery stores of the world, um, we get their input. Um, and then we have an incredible team of project managers. Uh, as you can imagine, there's a lot of moving parts when you're creating uh, something new and they help us keep track of it all. So um, it really does uh, take a village. Okay, so uh, Corona Premier, uh, an innovation around the Corona brand, uh, obviously the hard seltzers and innovation around your big brand. Um, uh, Hector asks a, a great question uh, that I'm gonna uh, uh, sort of riff off of for a minute or two. He asks almost as a sort of like a provocation, why don't you create a more artisanal beer? Do you, when you're thinking about innovation, are you thinking about um, creating a beer that's going to sell 
the most, the biggest, you know, beat uh, your competitors? Or do you also think about sort of the niche consumer out there and what they're interested in? Yeah, Hector, that's a, um, it's a great question. I think the short answer is hopefully we, we'd like to do both. Um, the first product that I ever worked on and that Constellation ever launched as a new product was a beer, a craft beer that we did in partnership with the chef Rick Bayless here in Chicago. Uh, and it was called Takayo Hominy White Ale. Uh, it was a great product. Uh, we worked with uh, Chef Bayless and his team to source ingredients from Mexico. And the idea was, um, how do you take our knowledge of, of Hispanic consumers and Mexican ingredients and combine that with the thriving craft beer scene that's here in Chicago? And so we kind of blended the two and, and rolled it out in the world. And um, unfortunately, it, it didn't stick around, um, but it was a great first step um, for us into that space. And we it really helped us to kind of learn what that, that was all about. So... Um, we do have uh, what we call a new to world insight or excuse me, an innovation team that's focused on creating completely new brands. Um, for example, we recently rolled out a brand called Wildish. Under Wildish, we have uh, an alcoholic um, hard tea. Um, and that is a great example of how we looked at more emerging trends um, to bring a new product to life. Um, we always start with the idea. We always start with what, what it is that the consumer is looking for. Um, and then it's part of my team's job to figure out where in the portfolio does that fit? So we call it the build, borrow, buy model. Um, do we build it from the ground up? Do we borrow the equity of a brand like Corona or Modelo? Or do we go out and invest um, in a product that might be a little bit further along in the development process? And, and try to bring that into our portfolio. So we work hand in hand with our, um, we have a ventures team uh, that does a lot of that work. And um, sometimes we find that it's more efficient for us to just um, partner with or invest in an existing brand. So, um, you know, we do, uh, we do look at sort of the more, um, what we call emerging uh, trends um, and bring those to life, but we, we kind of have to balance that with the scale um, of our bigger brands, knowing that at the end of the day, um, those big brands like a Corona or Modelo are more likely to bring more people in on day one. Um, so we're really looking at the end of the day to create a balanced portfolio uh, between those two types of products. You know, you mentioned uh, the celebrity chef, Rick Bayless. Um, you, you talked about, uh, uh, about the uh, innovation with Rick. Um, you use other celebrities, you work with other celebrities, uh, Kenny Chesney, I think around mm -hmm. the Corona brand. Um, you, you're doing something with um, uh, a country singer. How do you, how do you pair up the brand and the celebrity to um, bring it to market? Yeah, um, great question. We just launched a new beer called Tulane American Lager. Uh, with Luke Bryan this year. So for anyone out there who's a Luke Bryan fan, uh, give it a try. Um, and then we also, uh, as you can see right here, we launched uh, a hard seltzer uh, as well with Luke. Um, that was a that was a really fun one. Um, Luke is just about like the nicest uh, celebrity you could possibly imagine. Um, and he genuinely wanted to be part of the process. So he really um, was involved in the, the creation of the product. Um, he was tasting it. He was giving us feedback. He was working with our brewers until um, we created something that he was really proud of. So you asked about how we pick uh, who it is that represents our, our brands. And, you know, in that case, that was really all about finding somebody who shared the same values as the consumer we were trying to reach. Um, we heard from a lot of consumers that they were looking for easy to drink, uh, sessionable beers that they could take uh, outside uh, fishing or hunting or hiking. Um, and they didn't feel like there was a brand that really spoke to them. They wanted a brand that felt a little bit more specific to who they were, that kind of understood um, where they came from. Uh, and Luke Bryan was kind of the perfect embodiment of that. So first we found the consumer and the consumer need. And then we thought about, well, what would this person uh act like and, and what do they care about? What are their values? And then with that information, those two things synced up and, and Luke felt like the perfect partner. So 
that's just one example, but uh, really it all comes down to making sure that the values of our consumers uh, and the brand, and then anybody we choose to represent that brand, uh, making sure all those things align. Uh, you know, Julia, you come from uh, outside the beer industry, outside the beverage alcohol industry, having worked on Nature Valley and Valvita. Um, uh, sometimes there's a, um, uh, the wrap on beer is that it's a male dominated business. Uh, if you're a female leader inside your company, which is a, um, a large beer importer and brewer in the United States. Um, how do you see the role of women in your company? How do you see the role of women in beer generally? And, and do you see more women um, coming to the beer business for their careers? Um, I do. I do. And it has been really incredible to be part of an industry that is so welcoming and so open to bringing in new new and diverse perspectives. And that has been far and away one of the things that I have loved most about my time um, at Constellation and my time in, in the beer industry as a whole. Um, Constellation has made incredible strides in um, uh, promoting and um, really embracing uh, female leadership. Um, so there are a number of women uh, and in our organization that I look up to um, and admire and I'm proud to work with every day. Um, and I'm seeing it across the industry as well. So I think, um, you know, you look look across some of our other uh, big uh, competitors and, and they have um, more and more women in their top ranks as well. Um, you know, when you asked about what, you know, how does that impact what we do and the industry as a whole? And I think at the end of the day, it's all about representing our consumers. And so when our companies look like the people that we sell our products to, um, we can do a better job of bringing products to market that fit the needs of those consumers. So I'm really happy when I look around and I see um, a more a diverse coalition of people in this industry than I did even just a few years ago, because it means that we're really taking seriously the idea of, of representation um, and that making sure that we, um, you know, represent the folks that we are looking to uh, sell products to. Um, well, you're certainly selling products in a uh, weird time uh, in <laughs> America and the public health and economic crisis. Could you talk a little bit about how the pandemic has affected um, what you're doing in your job every day and uh, how Constellation is um, positioning itself in the marketplace and and how that uh, how that has affected the the morale inside the company yeah uh it's been a weird year <laughs> for everybody right so you know i think um back in uh march uh when when folks were uh starting to spend more time at home we weren't really sure how it was all going to play out. You know, were, were people going to drink more? Were they going to drink less? Um, do they want new brands? Do they want innovation? Or do they want to just uh, drink the kinds of things that they, they're already familiar with? And uh, as it turned out, kind of all of the above <laughs> was true. Um, so what we saw kind of in the very early stages uh, of 2019 was that, or excuse me, of 2020, um, was that folks were really gravitating towards brands that they were familiar with. Um, a lot of stocking up, as you can imagine, March and April, people weren't taking a ton of trips to the grocery store. Um, so they'd kind of maybe go in, grab a 24 pack of a brand that they were familiar with and um, a pantry load, right? Um, and as the months went by, uh, what we found was a pretty dramatic shift in consumer behavior. So um, you know, still a big uptick um, in uh, beer and beer drinking overall. Um, but we just did a survey and we found that two thirds of consumers who are millennials and younger have tried a new kind of alcoholic beverage um, since March 2020. So what that told us was that there is still a place for innovation, even in this kind of weird world we're living in. Uh, we weren't sure, again, if people were going to kind of just retreat to what they knew. And it turned out that rather um, people were really looking for uh, new and interesting products. They wanted to have those experiences that they were no longer able to have in person. 
Um, and so that gave us a lot of energy to really uh, light a fire under our pipeline. We're working on a lot of new products that will roll out uh, next year. Um, and I think uh, we've been really excited to see the energy that consumers have for um, new products and new brands, even in a time of, of uncertainty. And I think, um, you know, beer is one of those things that's a, it's a, a little luxury, right? There, <laughs> I think times are tough for a lot of folks and um, beer in many ways is, um, you know, it's a, it's a small joy. Um, it's something that brings uh, happiness to people and it's, it's affordable, it's, it's easy to access. Um, and so for all those reasons, we're finding that people are still gravitating um, towards the category and, and still trying new things. It is a small joy. There's um, uh, a lot of discussion going on about whether uh, there's um, sort of too much drinking going on during the COVID crisis. Um, our, our data indicates that that's not the case. You know, when you close down uh, the bars and restaurants in the United States for an extended period of time, uh, we sell a lot of beer in those places, right? So it's um, so you gravitate towards the off-premise, your pantry load, um, but um, but uh, you still have to create uh, the new beers that are going to come along down the line. So how do you? So just I think it'd be interesting for our uh, viewers to understand you're you're uh, as we said earlier inventing beer. You're not putting that on the shelf six months later. Talk about talk a little bit about. <laughs> Uh, how long it takes to get to the market um, uh, generally for one of the one of the brands you're trying to innovate? Yeah, um, you know, I, I'm glad you're asking this now. I think if if we'd been talking, say, a year ago, I, the answer I probably would have given was somewhere between 12 and 18 months. So usually what happens is we, we call it a, a funnel. We have lots of ideas that kind of swirl around. And then we we narrow and we narrow. We pick ideas that we think are going to be great new products. We iterate on those. And then finally, um, we come up with something we think is really great and we put it out in the marketplace. Um, and for folks uh, who aren't familiar with the beer brewing process, uh, it does take at least three weeks, sometimes four, um, for that process to um, go through to completion. Um, so unlike... Um, some other products I've, I've worked on in the past where you might be able to kind of, you know, whip up something um, in a day if you wanted to have a new prototype. Um, the, the beer brewing process, uh, you know, takes takes some time. So, um, you know, we found that, uh, you know, at least at least a couple months uh, tend to go by as we're producing new things. Um, however, in 2020, we have really been challenged to move faster. Um, we are working on some projects right now that will go from um, concept to uh, production ready product in maybe 12 to 16 weeks at most. Um, so uh, I'm really proud of my team. We're kind of breaking records <laughs> um, at Constellation for how quickly we're moving. Um, and, you know, then another thing to keep in mind is we work, of course, with big retailers across the country um, they have standards and expectations for when new items hit their shelves. Um, as you can imagine, uh, it would be really inefficient for them to just be throwing new items on the shelf every day. So many of them have um, very strict timelines for when they reset their shelves. Um, so we might have an item ready to go, um, but we might not be able to actually get it on grocery store shelves nationally uh, until our retailers are ready for that. Um, so typically, you know, uh, could be as long as 18 months. Um, it could be short as uh, just a few months um, from the time we have the idea to the time a consumer is able to go buy it at the grocery store. So you mentioned, uh, uh, you know, starting a new brewery earlier. I'm going to I'm going to ask the first question that came in a little while ago from Michael, and then the last question uh, that just came in from Jim. Um, I, you may have some uh, sense of this how, from Michael. How do you What's the biggest hurdle that a new brewery or a new brewer will face uh, sort of coming into this beer market? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think from from where I sit and I'm, I'm certainly not um, a brewer, so I'll, I'll leave any uh, technical hurdles to uh, that part of yeah. my team. But, you know, from my perspective, I think the biggest hurdle right now is, is differentiation. 
Um, so one of the most exciting things that's happening in the beer category right now is how many folks are involved. And we've seen uh, an incredible growth of small and craft brewers in the past few years and folks who've really found a passion for this industry. Um, and that's a tremendous thing uh, for the beer category as a whole. However, with, with that comes the need to um, really make your product stand out. And what we're finding is that that's becoming harder and harder and harder. Um, and so I think uh, for folks who are looking to, to get into this industry and maybe to launch um, their own new products one day, um, it has to, it, at the end of the day, it kind of comes down to, you know, how, what are you doing differently? Um, how are you going to stand out from the crowd, whether it's through design, uh, through uh, product, through flavors, through experience? Um, so really uh, thinking about what it is that you're doing uh, different from the rest. That's great advice. That's great advice. And I'm gonna I'm gonna end. Uh, you've been so generous with your time and your insights. Thank you so much. I'm gonna end with this last question from Jim. This is terrific. How do I get a job at, in Constellations Innovation <laughs> Department? Jim, call me. <laughs> uh, we would love to have you. Um, it's it's a pleasure and an honor to uh, to do what we do every day. Um, I feel really lucky to be part of something that brings um, a little bit of joy and happiness to people uh, in their everyday lives. And um, we'd love to have you join us if you're interested. So let me know. Well, Julia Foxworthy, uh, Director of Innovation for Constellation Brands Beer Division, thank you so much uh, for uh, joining us. I hope that uh, the mm -hmm. viewers uh, got to learn uh, a little bit about what you do and how you got to do what you do and uh, know something uh, a little bit more about uh, one of the 2.1 million Americans who uh, work uh, in beer. Um, uh, let me just say thank you to you, Julia. Thank you to uh, all of the participants who um, Zoomed in today. Uh, our next um, uh, webinar will be on October 22nd. Um, Adam Warrington, you talked to earlier, Julia, about um, the, uh, you know, better for you. We're going to talk to Adam Warrington, who, is the, uh, who uh, does a lot of work for Anheuser-Busch uh, in its Better World Division. So uh, that's October 22nd, the afternoon of October 22nd, uh, for the next installment of You Ought to Know a Beer Industry Employee. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.